Hello and welcome to another session of the Change Exchange and today our guest is Bonnie Mbuli. I'm so glad to meet you and to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm really honoured to be here today. Bonnie, we talk change moments yes. on, at this forum, on this forum. You were 13 when yeah. your life changed yeah. dramatically. What happened? I was at a bus stop coming home from school. Um, there was a whole bunch of us. We always caught the same bus there every day. Then I'm 74. It was around 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, Johannesburg. Johannesburg, Greenside. I went to Greenside High School. And I was always a very, um, I always tried to be very inconspicuous in school. I, I didn't like standing out. I always kind of just, always, you know, moved to the back or just <laughs> find, find a way to hide. Um, and this particular day, an agent stopped her. Uh, I didn't know she was an agent, but she was this eccentric woman with fiery red hair. And she walked out of the car and she an, handed out these pamphlets. Um, and on them it said, do you want to be a TV star? And of course I thought, no, I don't want to be a TV star, how stupid has to be. Put it in my pocket and just watched all the kids get excited and, oh, I'm going to go, it's so exciting. Um, there were about maybe 15 of us at the bus stop. She got into her car and she drove off and she suddenly stopped, she reversed, made a beeline for me. And she said to me, I really want you to come and see me. I think that you look absolutely incredible on screen. Um, and I thought... Oh, the first thing I thought was, too much attention, too much attention. <laughs> and she got back into her car and she left. And of course, everyone started, you know, yes. asking me what she said, what's going on. Um, but I'll tell you why I went to see her. It's because I, in that, that moment, stood out so much for me where somebody had seen something in me without me doing anything to attract it or, mm. to, or to garner that kind of that affirmation. I was just standing there really doing nothing. And um, it just sparked my curiosity. I wanted to find out what it was that you actually had seen. And I wanted more of that affirmation. And when you were in front of the cameras for the first time, was it, did it come naturally? Something lit up inside of me. It was like I, it was like I had another world inside of me. And suddenly I just was able to communicate it to a camera. And I, and I found comfort in, in knowing that it was nobody else but me in this machine. Um, and I knew it couldn't talk back and I knew it couldn't judge me. <laughs> um, and I just came alive, I really did. And even to this day, my persona on camera is very different to my persona off camera. Yeah. But since then, you've worked on, and I made a list, Backstage, Home Affairs, Gazlam, Rhythm, Rhythm City, Soul City, Traffic, Rockville, what what is the key to being cast again and again again and again wow you know for me when i started out in, in this industry everyone kept telling me that well, you always needed something to fall back on that it wasn't a career that you could have for a lifetime and and i always had at the back of my mind a quest to defy that and i and i thought to myself well there's got to be a way because otherwise then it's not a career is it and it's not something that you can get really good at and why is anyone doing it if it's if you can't have it forever and i thought to myself well why does it bring me so much satisfaction if i can't have it forever and what else am i going to do and i thought about other things that i could do that i could enjoy doing and i always found that they were always still in the same field in the same industry in the same world um, and then I decided, well, I think what was best is to develop myself outside of just being an actress or a TV presenter. And I found that the more I focused on developing myself in other ways, I, 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 grew, I grew as an actor and I grew as a presenter and I grew as, as a writer. What do you mean um, in other ways? As in just, just self-development, constant stretching yourself, challenging yourself to learn new things, whether it's a new language or whether it's... Um, learning a new skill or just living really just making sure you're living and not and not existing in your job mm. all the time and i just found that there was just such a big world even in what i was doing that there was always something new to discover so i think the trick has been for me not to focus on one thing but to constantly keep myself excited about what i what i do and also just Understanding that it's it's something it's a legacy I want to leave. 
it's something I want to, I want my work to live beyond the fame, beyond the relevance, beyond when everyone's not talking about me anymore or I'm not on the front page of a newspaper. I want to be able to look back and say, this is how I made a difference in people's lives. This is how I, um, my children will remember me as a, as a person who stood for a certain value and that value has changed people's lives around me in a positive way. I'm very big on giving back as well. So I do spend a lot of my time just giving back in any way that I can. And I find that it just keeps me excited about what I do. And I think if I walk into a casting or an audition and that excitement is immediately infectious and it's, it's just in the atmosphere, there's something that gets the people on the other side of the camera excited about working with me. And it keeps you, more about me. Yeah. keeps you three dimensional. Exactly. You don't become just a cardboard character. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, so that's what I find. And you've also worked on in film, um, Invictus, yes. Drum, uh, what's the other one, Catch a Fire? Catch a Fire. Oh, how is that different? Angels. Well, film is, film is far more expensive, I find, than television. Um, I mean, television is always kind of about hitting your mark at a certain point and making sure you don't step too far to the left because then you're out of frame. Um, making sure that you, you're not casting a shadow on, on your co-actor. It's, it's very, it can tend to even be almost robotic. Mm, mechanical. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the word. And I find film is just, it's just there's so much more time allowed to explore emotions you um it's, it's not a rush to fit into 30 episodes because mm -hmm. a lot of the film is made in the editing process so there's so much more time given to what could become there's always a possibility that we could discover on set of, of what a scene could become and working with international stars and people who have who experience and live in a much bigger world Wow. Matt Damon, Morgan Freeman, yes. Clint Eastwood. That's, I mean, I started working with, with international stars from a very young age. I remember being shooting a, a, a film called uh, Born Free 2 when I was 13. And um, it starred all the, 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 the gang from Jurassic Park. And I remember Jurassic Park was huge then and everyone was talking about these young kids. And I remember being around them and and just really getting over the idea of people being larger than life and larger than... I mean, we were all kids and they were quite bratty. <laughs> and I think I just got over it. I realized they were just human yeah. and that they were going to behave like humans and that we were all there to um, contribute in a, in a meaningful way to a, a bigger story and that it, I needed to just participate in, in the greatest confidence that I could have. And, and so, I'm sure that also when you yourself became a known face yeah it must also have have played into that that you know let me not take myself so seriously i know people who are international exactly. stars exactly yeah <laughs> so by the time i mean i met the morgan friedmans and the clint eastwoods and the Ted Diggs, um philip noises with tim robbins it you know i always just my first approach was always you're here to bring uh, very important and amazing work. I've seen your work, mm -hmm. and I honor that. Yeah. Um, versus being fixated on on the persona the star. of a person, yes, because mm -hmm. I mean that that would really destabilize me as 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 a performer. Then I wouldn't be able to match um, and deliver whatever needs to be delivered mm -hmm. in a scene. Yeah. And uh, TV presentation, working as a presenter. Yeah. How yeah. do you enjoy that? I love presenting because I actually finally get to be myself because I've spent so many years not playing myself on screen um, and, and highlighting aspects of other people's stories, other people's characters and finally with presenting there's a settling and a relaxing that happens because I'm just being myself and I'm saying the things I would normally say in conversation although I, I, there is kind of a heightened uh, personality yeah, mm. that you need to bring to presenting where you know, you, um, you have to sound a little bit more exciting than you usually are, a little bit more fun, a little more charismatic. <laughs> um, and sometimes Baraka helps me with that. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's a space I really enjoy. And I mostly enjoy it because I get to meet so many different people. Um, and I ask them a wide variety of questions. Interviewing is my favorite thing to do. Um, and just bringing people out or creating an atmosphere where people feel like, they can, they're safe and they can just pour out their hearts. I really enjoy that. 
Yeah, that for me is yeah. also the, the key to an interview, to make the other people feel safe yeah. and create a space where it can happen. Right, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. And you wrote a memoir. Yes. Um, eye bags and, and dimples. And dimples. <laughs> um, quite exposing. How did you experience, why did you decide to do that and how did you experience it? You know, when I initially started writing, I hadn't decided to write the book. You just I, wanted to get it out there. I needed there. to get something out of me. I just had this gunk of a, just a dark mass of pain in the middle of my of my soul that I didn't know what to do with. And I've always written from a young age, and I always had found writing very therapeutic, and very um, freeing. And it was just it was a place where when I was in, I could just really interrogate my emotions and, and what was going on in my head without judging it. I, I take on the role of the writer and not the role of Bonnie, you know. Um, and I become more of a witness, a silent witness. And more awareness comes into my space in that way. But what happened is I was now struggling with depression. Um, and I was diagnosed with clinical depression. And I, I kind of just needed to understand when it had all happened, how and why. So I'm a very analytical thinker, so I thought, well, the best thing to do is to maybe just order my, the, the events of my life chronologically, um, order my, my thinking around it, and what kind of thought patterns developed when. And so then I just decided to just write everything that I remember happening, how it made me feel, and how it had changed me afterwards. And it was and a rough I childhood, to, huh? It was rough. It was, it was a, yeah, it was a burdensome childhood. I had to grow up really quickly. I had to be responsible for uh, a lot more than I knew how to be responsible for. Um, and then it was, you know, met by this other persona of being this tele on television and suddenly being thrust into the spotlight. And yet I felt like I had this mess inside that I had to keep protecting um, and maintaining this outer persona as um, quite perfect. And it kind of made me a very, rebellious um, celebrity or anti-celebrity maybe kind of poop on the whole idea of, of being famous and, and being well liked mm. <laughs> which wasn't what I wanted ideally but I, I just kept having this foreboding sense of being found out and then you actually found yourself out and then out. I found myself out because and then <laughs> put it out there yeah and what was that experience? It like? was so cathartic and it was it was so empowering because I was finally owning the finding out and I knew that if I, if I put it out there nobody was going to come back and point a finger at me or judge mm. me because I decided to be in charge of of that whole process. And so the more I wrote the more I realized that this the stuff that had happened to me had really really just affected my personality and still was and had affected ways of thinking and ways of, of operating and I'd become quite self-sabotaging in many ways and I just felt I was so struck by the loneliness of it for so long and I just wanted to say to people if you're going through this don't let it take as long as it took me to find out don't endure the loneliness you can get help um, and that if you speak up, um, there's help available and it'll come really quickly. So I was willing to put myself out there and be, and be the sacrificial lamb. And I say sacrificial because there is a, a sense of privacy that I feel like I've lost forever from exposing myself in that mm -hmm. way. You uh, married Sisanda Hina, Hina yes. and then you went to America together. Yeah. Why did you go? Why did you come back? The whole Hollywood dream is always kind of like the holy mm. grail for, for any actor or performer. And um, was after, this after after Catch a Fire, which really thrust me into the international acting world in a very really big way. Um, and it was met with great like critical acclaim about my performance. I I was in in two thousand and five. I was listed as the top six uh, performers of the year by the New York Times. Um, and there were all just in media interests from all over the world. And I was just doing one interview after the other, and they were saying, "Hey, a star is born." This is reminiscent of the time when Nicole Kidman was discovered. It was a, it was quite giddy. You know, um, and I then got an agent in, in LA while I, I spent about three, three months in LA doing press junkets and traveling uh, to film festivals in LA was a base. And I, I found an agent and a manager. And they, you know, 
convinced me, saying that, look, you can't launch this career from little South Africa. You've got to come to this platform, which is what everybody does from anywhere in the world. Um, so come. And I thought, oh, I've got nothing to lose. I didn't have kids then, and I, I was just, I was newly married, and I, I couldn't lay to rest the idea that I wouldn't have pursued this shiny thing that I you had to try. screaming at me. I had to try, right? And so I, I tried not so, um, it wasn't so well planned, and it was, it was quite, in many ways, reckless, which, which, which brought an excitement about it that I'll, I'll never really forget, you know? Um, and, I, and I moved to LA with $500 with um, my husband at the time. And we just, it was, we roughed it. I mean, uh, needless to say, our timing was awful because we arrived the day after the Hollywood strike had begun, the writer's strike, which was going to last for another seven months. Um, <laughs> so nothing was going on. But it did give me an opportunity to meet a lot of um, uh, casting directors and producers, everyone who had downtime now because the writers were striking. And uh, I'd, I'd drive to all the studios and see them picketing outside the studios. Um, and I had many conversations that later on actually became quite pertinent in me being sent scripts and me being headhunted for roles. And I still do, which is really an incredible um, honor. And the decision to come back? Well, the decision to come back was just after like seven months of like really just slogging it and braving it and hustling and it not giving way because it was just the wrong time in Hollywood. Um, and then us not being able to get work permits and work visas um, because you can only stay for six months at a time no matter how long your visa is. So we, had, we both had 10 year visas, but you had to exit and re-enter the country every six months. So Which cost money. Which cost money course and and of course the writer's strike was still full steam ahead and uh, I left and by the time I left I was I was depressed and disillusioned and disappointed and tired and hurt um, and I just came back to South Africa to leave my wounds. <laughs> and what happened when you when you arrived here um, was, were there new opportunities? I then well I then was just plunged into this like abyss of depression and dealing with that and mm -hmm. And I think what had happened is, I, when I got to LA, I was so exposed, um, and I didn't have my usual crutches and the usual things to fall back on, that it, it kind of exposed things in me that were happening at a deeper level, issues that I'd maybe evaded or run away from for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So now it was time to actually deal with what had been exposed or unpacked, and that's when I started writing a book. Yeah. Yeah. I went on to meds and I started writing. And you were healed in and the process. And I got healed. And, yeah. I, and, and I found the power within myself to heal myself. That was, that was really, really liberating. You were quite open um, about the struggles during the marriage yes. and then the divorce. Yes. How did you get through that? Because it's sore. It's deeply painful. It is very painful. It is very painful. I mean, I was I went through years of a very radical, also intense relationship with the church, um, where at one stage we were we were training to be ministers. And Both then, of you. Yeah. So I nearly became a full time minister. Um, <laughs> so you know, so so it was it was this we had this marriage that was very entrenched in a in a system that was very um, big on you know maintaining those kind of um, well, I don't know, maybe you just put itself as a custodian of, of, of marriage. So it felt like, you know, with a marriage that was breaking down, um, I couldn't pull out of that marriage without pulling out of this mm. greater system, which was really hard. I mean, it was a hard thing to, to come to terms with. And um, it just felt like a huge unplugging mm. when everything fell apart. But we've always, um, I mean, we have two children together. And we, we had always lived our lives in a very, we were friends. We were always friends more than anything. And so even when, the, when everything was breaking down, we were ever so careful to just protect each other's hearts and to, and to remember that we were going to be raising these kids for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that um, we just never at any point wanted to look back and find that we just behaved in a way that we, we couldn't account for. 
later. You know, where you couldn't just say, well, I was drunk that night and I was too angry that night and, I, and you made me so mad. It's not, that's not really I'm accounting for I'm not taking for responsibility, it's yeah. your fault. Yeah, funny, all the lessons that we learned in the marriage were now actually playing themselves out in our, in our breaking up because we were just really kind to each other and, and still are and, and very uh, careful to protect our children. Um, one of the quotes um, that I, I read in a book about separation and divorce and all that stuff when it was happening, it said, um, I, I, don't, I don't remember who said it, but they said, when the elephants fight, it's the grass that gets trampled. And it just completely, you know, turned my perception of what was happening into from, you know, brought it to a different vantage point where for me it just became about protecting the grass, protecting the children and mm. understanding that. I mean, whether it be selfish or not, whatever reasons we were breaking up for, nobody else had to pay for it. You know? so, it was your decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. having said that, it doesn't mean it was easy in a walk in the park. It just means that we, we just navigated it mindfully. How do you handle the parenting from Johannesburg where Susanna lives? Yes. And you in Cape Town? Everyone does a lot of traveling, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of FaceTiming. Um, a lot of bedtime stories read on FaceTime. <laughs> I mean, for, for all our technological advancements in, in the world, one of the things I'm grateful for about that is that, you know, it can bring people closer. Um, and Sander's a great father. So um, he's got so much to share with his children and they, and they make so many beautiful memories. I mean, every holiday is this big adventure where they trek off into the woods. I mean, he's quite the jock and they also just you know, happy to go. They all have little sleeping bags and we'll put up the tents together. I mean, I, I get sent pictures from their holiday and I'm like, wow, how amazing, <laughs> you know. I, I didn't even have a childhood close to that and neither did he. So in the end, we just, I think we became better parents. And your relationship with your mother, did that change once you had children? Definitely. I mean, I just... I think one of the, the, the notions that got shattered through my um, experience of just looking back on my childhood and, and becoming a mother was just that, that thing that happens where mommy comes off the pedestal and is no longer just mommy because there's this, you know, all mm. these ideas and, and associations that we make with someone being a mother. We yeah, just the ideally ideal. expect them to yes. be superhuman. Um, and then when they suddenly stop being just mommy and they have a name, and their name is Bonnie Booley or Lizzie Booley, you realize they also had this whole life of being human. Mm -hmm. Things happened to them and they met people and they got hurt and they, um, they lived a whole life. And, and that in your consideration of how you were parented, you have to take that into account. And, and you suddenly can. And I suddenly, yeah, because I needed the same compassion now because I was a mother <laughs> and feeling like, oh my gosh, am I even going to survive this? And understanding that I, I wanted to be accepted for who I was as much as I was daily attempting to be a better mother in, in any way that I could. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to constantly be, you know, be... Recognized be, as, yeah, a person as a person as well. As a person as well. So mm -hmm. I, I did that eventually with mm -hmm. my mother and it just healed and fixed so many things. And the move to Cape Town, was that, um, it must, it's a huge, major change. It is a major and change. Did a go? I've always loved Cape Town. I, mm. I, I love the sea, I love the, the, the mountain, I love just the whimsical nature of Cape Town. You know. um, I Funny, I've never felt like I belonged in Joburg. I, my whole life I lived in Joburg feeling like, there's got to be something else, there's got to be a different place. I, I couldn't... I couldn't really withstand the, the um, that constant push that needs to happen mm. in Joburg. I mean, it's it's very electrifying, and it can get you really working hard. Um, but, it's, but also it's also exhausting. exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> it's also exhausting, and and you can you can't really tell when you're way ahead of yourself. It, it takes a big bang, or you getting really mm. ill, or, or something really negative happening to shift your focus all the time. So what, what was that shift for you? I, gu I guess perhaps for me it was, because what happened is we, when we returned from LA, I moved to Cape Town. Oh. Mm. And, and lived in Cape Town for four years. And um, we moved back to Joburg for a year. 
that's when my marriage fell apart and then I moved back to, to Cape Town again because I felt like that was the last place I remember where I felt sane, or normal or happy. What is it in Cape Town? If you say Cape Town, what is the picture? It's a feeling of peace. It's a feeling of space. You know? um, I also just love that things are in closer proximity. So I, I spend less time driving. <laughs> And the pace and is really slightly slower. It is slightly slower. Yeah. And, and some people are energized by that, you know, versus some people are energized by a faster pace. But I feel like when things are still and quiet, I get a whole lot more done. But when there's noise and pressure and um, push to go, 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 I get far less done because I spend so much time worrying and being in angst about what I need to do and never actually getting to do it. Lying yeah. awake because you're lying awake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what are you, are you working on another book? Fiction? I am working on another book. You know, one of the most um, encouraging things that happened after I published the memoir, uh, I Have Eggs and Pools, it went on to become a bestseller. It's, it's on the top 10 list of most stolen books in South Africa. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's it's comforting or <laughs> a bit depressing, but also just, I'm glad people are reading because I'm, I'm one of those writers who are, um, I'm about, every book I write, I want to make sure that there's at least 20 more people who are now reading who never read before. I, I, that's always what's at the back of my mind when I write. And so I don't mind, I guess, that people are stealing the book. I mean, people are tearing pages out of the book as well. It's fine. <laughs> um, but what happened is, I, I Zakes and Da, growing up, I always read Zakes and Da, and I always just thought, what a phenomenal writer, how does he write like that? Um, and he picked up my book and read it, and sent me a message on Twitter. Um, he said to me, hello, my child, I've just read your book, it's amazing, um, you're such a talent. Uh, he said, your ability to um, delve into your character's psychological um, landscape is really, really remarkable, and, and you'll, he said you'll bake yourself a good fiction writer. And I thought, okay, that's all I needed. <laughs> what a fantastic, um, I mean, talk about affirmation. I mean, yes, you know, and I just thought, well, this doesn't happen every day. I mean, I grew up saying I want to one day, perhaps, maybe write like Zegs of Da, and, and that affirmation was just too big to ignore. And I thought, well, so you're doing it. I'm doing it. Yes. Doing it. Yes. Fiction is definitely harder because, I mean, um, truth is stranger than fiction. I think nothing is more exciting than the truth. <laughs> Anything you imagine could be quite impressive, but the truth will shock you. <laughs> but so it, it's hard to sit down and imagine a riveting, gripping story. You know? Which is not too far fetched. Yeah, exactly. Tell me about your home in Cape Town. What mm -hmm. made you choose it? Oh, I'm such a nomad as well, so I'm always moving, I'm always moving around Cape Town. How do the kids um, react to no, that? No, they don't react too well. So my son said to me the other day, no more changes, no more changing. Everything that we have now stays the same. And I said, okay, I, I, I heard you. I, and I mean, I was already feeling like, oh, you're just putting too much. Oh, and it's, I guess it's little things. It's like, no, I need us to have a bigger garden so we can get a dog. No, we need a, you know, it's, I mean, it was all like, um, it was all in light of what they, they need and what would be better for them. But we're really happy where we are. We live in a house in Mulberry and it's got a garden and we can have a puppy. We went to visit um, the SPCA the other day to get a rescue um, and interview the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I, what I, I think what I love about Cape Town as well is just a sense of a different quality of life. I mean, in the mornings, I, I run my son to school while he rides his bike um, versus getting stuck in traffic for mm -hmm. about 40 minutes. So those are the things I really value about Not all Capetonians can do that, no. but you're very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am really there. Is there um, something that you've taken with you on your roaming? Is there an ornament or a cushion or a something? Oh, that's quite interesting. Um, I, I always take my books. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, very precious about my And books. you unpack them. They don't live them. in boxes. No, never. Never, because I love rereading books as well. Uh, and I love rediscovering books. Um, so that, my books go everywhere with me. And I think it's little things that I'm attached to. And it's mostly things that 
I was given to by friends, gifts. Mm. I'm, I'm a very big gift person. I, I, I've read the book Love Languages, and one of my um, love languages um, gifts. Mm. So I really, really value gifts that people give me. Yeah. Well, we look forward to your novel. Yes, and um, I don't have to, to buy it a and not to yet. steal it. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're not allowed to steal it. Um, I don't have a working title yet, but um, I'm really excited about what's going to come out of it. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much.